As we approach the tail end of the current generation, in terms of the quality and variety of indie games, well we've never really had it so good. The past decade and a half really coinciding with the launch of the Xbox Arcade back in late 2005 has given us a golden age for games from smaller independent studios and with this independence we've seen countless works of genius with games looking into and addressing topics AAA studios dent or simply aren't able to touch. Welcome once more to Get Indie Gaming and to the first of a new series where we take a look back and rank the best 10 indie games we've played and enjoyed each year starting simply as it's a nice round number back in 2010. We've been planning this series for a good few months and in all honesty, whittling down all the games we've played in the last 10 years has been incredibly hard and we realise and understand other people's opinions will almost certainly be different to our own and of course that's just fine. So with that, let's crack on with our rundown of what we think are the best 10 indie games of 2010. Let's begin at number 10 with the first of two games in this rundown with the word Super in the title. Here we have Super Crate Box. Now our small little team here at Get Indie Gaming, well we're all around the same age and all of us spent far too much of our childhood weekends, well Saturday as back then places were closed on Sunday, down at the long since gone local arcades where we all grew up. We fondish memories of chucking 20 pence pieces, the UK equivalent at the time to the US quarter, into the slots of many an arcade game where the only real aim was to get a high score and perhaps make it onto the first page leaderboard which as far as we can remember only happened once for us while away on holiday at a campsite in northern France. In any case, Super Crate Box delights today as it did back then. It recently had a Switch release and we've played it of late on that platform and again on an ageing PC. The gameplay has lost none of its punch or ability to have you mutter just one more go, where you suddenly find it's 4am and you've got to get up for work in a couple of hours. It's that wholesomely addictive, with its super tight and balanced control system which makes your handling of the character feel fine and nimble, which is a fabulous achievement. For some, while well, the learning and difficulty curve might be on the steep side, although like others in this rundown, practice, well it kind of makes perfect. This is classic arcade gameplay for home and feels as fresh today as it did 10 years ago. Coming next at number 10 and just like the previous game it certainly has an arcade feel to it. Nimbus is a mashup and mix of racing game, gliding game with some pretty decent puzzles all thrown into the mix. It's one of those titles that starts out simple enough, perhaps almost quite sedately and then boom. The difficulty ranks up pretty quickly with some sections being incredibly tricky needing a certain type of accuracy and finesse that some will love or others will simply loathe. What makes this that little bit different though are the puzzle sections. Now they can require quite a little bit of thought and once beaten can offer up for some real satisfaction and broad smiles all round. Looking back. Now this is the kind of game that with a few tweaks would probably do quite well if it came out on the Switch and we're pretty sure a new generation of players would find both challenge and fun within a reboot. Moving on at number 8 and perhaps the first of the list's better known games, Joe Danger came from Hello Games who you probably almost certainly know as the folks behind No Man's Sky and the very recent The Last Campfire. So what's so great about this one? On the face of things, well it's just another physics based stunt riding game, although while others such as Trails do try to make things well a little too serious, Joe Danger is wonderfully, well it's also very casual in the truest sense of the term. It's terrific to play alone or split screen and just as fun for others to passively watch, it's a supremely entertaining and it's exceptionally fun for its time. And hey, even still today, it looks and plays like a game from a larger AA or AAA developer and at times it's easy to forget this was made by a really small team and pound for pound, well this is still a cracking achievement. At number 7 and yep, another arcade type of game with Shatter, which to this day is one of the best tributes to Breakout ever made. For its time it was such a compelling package, it's got super Superb, stunning graphics and one of the best pop synth driven soundtracks of any game before it. 
would argue this took Breakout to just that next level with its power-up bosses, shields, multiballs, and much, much more. Particularly in places where you could complete a given section to progress even without having to shatter all of the bricks. Having once more looked back at this, well, we really should have covered this one before in one of our Hidden Gems series, as it's really that good. If you haven't seen any videos from that playlist where we take a look over indie games we think more people should play, you can check that out by following the card on screen now or via a link down in the description. At number 6, and while we don't play too many psychological horror games anymore, back in 2010 we rather enjoyed Amnesia The Dark Descent and wanted to give it a home in the best of this year's rundown, not for what's in the game, but what it leaves out. Like other far better writers and critics have said many times over, what Amnesia, like many of these things within the film and game genre does so well, is play with the player's imagination of what might be out there rather than what you can actually see. That uncertainty and suggestion of terror is so powerful, so much more so than guts, gore and most of the jump scares these games tend to rely on. The developers built and built upon this concept as the game progresses. The deeper you get, the more suggestive things become. Your player character also goes through stages of psychological change manifested not only in the visuals but also in the control input and outputs. Things become sluggish and, well, let's call them difficult. Amnesia The Dark Descent is a classic of the horror survival genre and with a follow-up expected out most likely next year, if you like a game that messes with your mind, there are few as good at doing it as this does. Up now and halfway through this rundown of the best indie games of 2010, we have Jolly Rover, and probably one of the best and less well-known games on the list. We couldn't do a countdown of the best games from this year without a point and click adventure game, and while it 2010 had a few heavy hitters in that genre, Jolly Rover was one we can still look back on with a wry smile. It's very silly in places and perhaps makes too much use of the way of dog puns, although the puzzles and challenges and the overall script are lightly handled. There's a fine and gentle sense of humour running throughout the tale and the hand-drawn characters were standout high points with their bright touches and heavy detail and the looks alone is one of the main reasons we're adding it into this rundown. The story, the dialogue, the writing, well, Jolly Rover really is well pieced out and it's a little gem of a pirate themed adventure. Next up at number 4 with it coming out by way of an Adobe Flash game before getting a port onto C++ a year later, that kind of makes sense. V as it's more commonly known is a supremely overlooked game even with its recent port onto the Switch from which these visuals have been taken. Now V is another one of those games that makes you think, well isn't it clever when you're playing it? While you're not able to jump, you are able to change the flow, as it were, of gravity, which means you can have your character fall upwards and downwards, and in so doing, make your way across the levels. It's terrifically unforgiving in places, although its implementation of, for its time, generous numbers and positioning of save points makes V just that little more accessible. At number 3, and in this countdown for the game it was back then rather than what it's become, and all the politics aside, in all honesty what's there to be said about Minecraft that's yet to be uttered? While technically an early version popped out in 2009, the alpha and beta versions, well they came out a year later, so that's the hook we're hanging our coat from. Now this kind of feels a little silly to say, and yet Minecraft wasn't ever about how it looked. Even for back in 2010, people were calling its visuals, well, they were saying it's a unique aesthetic, which is still today code for saying it looked pretty tired. But again, back then as it does still today, that wasn't the point. That wasn't what Minecraft was going for with its overall offering. It wasn't trying to look beautiful or play to its peers such as Gears or Uncharted. What it did do, and does as well today, is offer players of all ages, from preschoolers to those drawing their pensions, an open world outlook that affords almost unlimited creativity. What's more, in chatting with others, work colleagues, friends, family, those of us with a real affinity to the game, often speak of it in terms of it offering a gratifying experience that's of your own creation. 
Again, this comes down to the creativity side of things with everything you build and earn within the survival mode of your own doing. We've spoken to plenty of people in the making of this video and we've mentioned how great the game made them feel and how it made us feel as well. The gathering of resources or often the endeavors that you have to do require some sort of motivation and a sense of mastery and purpose. That kind of feeling is often talked about in such terms as workplace happiness and we can totally understand why it applies for the enjoyment people find in playing Minecraft. And as we say again to this day, I can easily recreate the moment and the fulfillment I felt and accomplishment when I put the finishing touches on my first rudimentary house. And what's more, I'm now able to share all of this once again from scratch with a family of my own. At number two, Super Meat Boy and its ever so lovable character is instantly recognizable, with this game often held way up high as one of the yardsticks of the entire indie gaming scene before and since its launch in October 2010. Now this is one of those games that while it is incredibly difficult with it needing pixel perfect platforming accuracy throughout, it's always been hyper rewarding and engaging to play. Much of this enjoyment comes by the way of feeling of success it affords when you make your way through it, section after section, bit by bit, with every death and every experiment, and well, you just kind of get better by playing, and in doing so, it creates a wonderful feeling, as we said with the Minecraft game, a feeling of mastery and accomplishment. Aside from, let's say, Celeste and perhaps the quite different Into the Breach, there are very few games out there that can do what Super Meat Boy does. For many, and to be honest, this is now us, but the skill set needed to complete this all the way through will be above many, but please, if you haven't played this yet, don't try and let that put you off, as it does reward repetition and patience, which is easy to say and less easy to pull off, particularly as you get to the pointy end of the game where the difficulty reaches the kind of levels associated with controller destruction and verbal utterances of the loudest and most potty mouthed conceivable, and that is just in the normal mode. We can totally forget about the even harder dark world mode where you can unlock it and for that your efforts are rewarded with an even super hard and each level for us well that's a whole heap of no right there. One of the best and most enjoyable payoffs though in getting all the way through a level is the option to watch all of your attempts to complete it. Here you can sit back and take a view as dozens and likely hundreds of your attempts are played out in front of you. So yes, there's no denying Super Meat Boy is brutal brilliant and beaten into second place in this rundown by the very narrowest of margins. At number one we have Limbo which came out in the summer of 2010 and it was this game that opened my eyes to the true power of what indie game storytelling can do. What Limbo does is really rather special within its grainy and soft focused styled black and white aesthetic. What makes it so good and something I hadn't experienced before picking this one up is how it tells a story all without dialogue or really any narrative handholding and the most simple of all soundtracks. There's virtually no signaling or handholding. The developers trust you, the player, to explore the world and in so doing, well you just do. You move left to right and while ultimately it's a tale not about death but about moving forwards after loss, all of this is ever so cleverly implied. Like all great puzzle games before and since, Limbo is one of those that makes you feel superbly clever for playing it. The wow moments come thick and fast with single and multi-layered elements that forgo gotchas or for what some people might call puzzle tricks or stunts. Now many of these puzzling sections end up, well, they do create the moments that trigger genuine joy, excitement and curiosity to wanting to keep play, to keep driving forward to the conclusion. While a relatively short game and one you can see off in the course of an extended single sitting or perhaps over the course of a weekend, it rewards replays with players going back in, better armed with a notion of what's to come and the benefits of hindsight for the enjoyment perspective. While 10 years old, Limbo has lost none of its potency and quite rightly is considered one of the keystone games in the evolution of indie game productions. So there we go, those are our top 10 indie games from 2010, with us wrapping up the first video in our new series. Of course, your picks might be quite different, so please let us know your favourites from this year down in the comments. As always, many thanks for watching, 
Many thanks, of course, to our Patreon supporters, and we look forward to seeing you all here once again for more indie game videos.